Welcome. Happy Tuesday. Welcome. Let's get started. One of the reasons I'd like to get started is I'm not so sure how far I will go today. <laughs> so 20 years ago, I was a graduate student in this classroom, in this class, and in that class, I met my wife, and she and I are now responsible for two fantastic, beautiful children who are both massively sick with a cold right now. And so I am also sick, and I was taking care of them up until 12, if you can believe that, and I got here. So I might well fall over. <laughs> so let's get through as much of the class as we possibly can. So I'm Professor Ryan Edwards. A quick note, I am recording this, or at least attempting to, using some technology that might be a little out of date. Um, first thing I should ask, though, is, can everybody hear me OK? Anybody in the back not hear me? OK. Well, sounds like we're all right. Um, the way I like to run class is if you, know, you can't hear me, or if you have a question, just uh, you know, shout it out, basically, as long as only one or two of us tries at a time, or hands, or whatever you might like to do. Uh, so I'm recording this uh, with luck. Yeah, fingers crossed it will be recorded and available to everybody, including we have two GSIs who are physically absent today and, and will be looking at the video, for example. Uh, so wish us luck with that. So today, what we're going to do is talk about course logistics, uh, the, the website. That's kind of the most important thing, I think, and for everybody arriving at this hour. So apologies. I, I guess we're sitting on the floor uh, there is a, a separate uh, space up here for wheelchair access. Somebody's welcome to take a chair and sit there. Um, please don't block the exits, I think is the main thing there, although I'm sure there probably aren't fire marshals <laughs> patrolling randomly in the room these days. Uh, so I'll talk about the website, then on to who we are, uh, so you can recognize us and reach out for when you might uh, need assistance. The semester plan the work and the grading, kind of the syllabus stuff, and then resources, some plugs for using things. How many people have used Piazza before? Oh, that's fantastic. So Piazza is the way to go, I think. Now, the best help you get is face-to-face. -face. That's why you're here still. Uh, their online learning, of course, has made leaps and bounds in progress, but you know, it's best just to get in front of somebody and to ask that person a question if you're confused. So Piazza, unfortunately, can't do that for you, but it can do a lot of other things. Okay, so I'll plug Piazza more later. <laughs> Maybe that was enough. I don't know. Th then we'll talk a little bit about what the class is about. And boy, uh, what isn't it about? I feel like everything in the news, except, of course, what's happening in the Senate right now, is basically all about economic demography. So the census of 2020 began today in Alaska. And it's because Alaska is very, very big. And so it turns out there already are enumerators out there looking around. Um, on my mind, of course, quite a bit has been uh, child care and choosing your family size and who is going to work and who is going to stay at home and what happens when both of you want to work. And then you've got to figure it out when they both get sick or your kids get sick, whatever it is. Anyway, so that, that's what this class is also about. And of course, I suppose you could argue, I don't think it's really true, but in an oblique sense, I suppose immigration is another topic that kind of is partly what's the deal is with you know people being so ticked off at a certain uh, commander in chief uh, in the Senate right now. Uh, not really, but so immigration is a big topic too, which of course comes up in the census, and we'll be talking about that as well. And then finally, to start the I think the drier material, to be honest, but we need to at some point take our medicine before we can have our dessert. Uh, talking about uh, population growth, aggregate populations, and the story about exponential growth and all that. So that that we hope we'll be getting to. First, let's talk about some of the nuts and bolts. And again, stop me uh, if, if you need clarification or need me to slow down. Um, the course website, this is the best one-stop shop for you. It's, of course, a, a bunch of words there. So you can also start uh, from B courses, which will lead you to uh, all the important pieces on the external website as well. So the, the nice thing about this URL um, is that everything uh, that you need to get to is for sure linked for, from there. And I think B courses also is the same. If you start with Gradescope or Piazza, I'm not sure we've set it up quite as, as slickly yet, but we might try. Uh, questions about, about that? Everybody's OK with B courses, probably? Uh, if you're not, go ahead and, and flag me or one of the, the GSIs. Okay, so who's who, and, and here we have headshots of folks, and as we, as we get to them, I'll ask the, the present GSIs to stand up and just wave to you so you see them. Uh, there are five of us uh, staffed here, so I'm Ryan Edwards. I, 
I actually have a PhD in economics from Berkeley, and I was here 20 years ago as I led off the class explaining. So that's silly me. This is a very uh, flattering headshot of me from several years back before we had children, and I didn't look like this. <laughs> so, uh, Katerina uh, Jensen is the second individual. She is also an economics PhD holder to be uh, later in, in, in 2020 here. So she is uh, currently in Europe and will be for several weeks. So if there's a burning question about uh, that, that you think is important for a, somebody with sort of more of a, uh, an economics background to address, you can, you can ask it of her. She'll have office hours over video conference that are listed in, in the office hours link. Was there a Okay, you're, never mind, sorry. <laughs> you're waving to a friend, I thought that was a question. Um, okay, uh, you can also, of course, ask me, and, and frankly, the other GSIs have either been expert GSIs at this class or have taken the class already, so you know it's not as if you need to ask an economist for something, they might well tell you the wrong thing. And anyway, we all know that, right? <laughs> that happens all the time. Um, okay, so, so Ryan, Katerina, uh, Felipe Menares, if I, I actually, do you, is that his last name or is it Menares? I don't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> With Menares, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, so Felipe Menares, who's a very uh, a, a cool chap there is the third. <laughs> so, I mean, he's got the coolest picture up here, right? <laughs> he's, it's, it's pretty sweet. So Felipe is also uh, not physically here, uh, but will be later, and he'll be holding office hours, I think, starting next week. And then now Andrea and Leslie are both here. So Andrea, we've got a placeholder. That's actually Esther Bozerup. It's not, she doesn't look like <laughs> that's Esther Bozerup. And then a uh, placeholder for Andrea, who also is a demography PhD sometime in 2020 something. This is Andrea. Thank you so much. And, and then Leslie uh, is, is next to her there. And she, you, so you're going to be a, a PhD this, this spring, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We are so lucky to have Andrea and Leslie and Felipe and Katerina. They are fantastic resources, uh, and I encourage you to, to use them and myself as much as you can. As we'll get into in a bit, uh, the way the class is structured is a little on the laissez-faire side. We don't force you to do much of anything except for attend, and we'll be using eye clickers for attendance with a, you know, a policy if you need to miss a class, that's fine too. I think I need to spell that out a little bit better. You need to do the labs, you need to do the, exa the exams, but you know the, the outreach stuff is a little bit more optional than it often is in econ classes, and so please keep that in mind. Where to find us, so this is a, a bird's eye view uh, of, of where we are in the little red circle there at, at the demography department, 2232 Piedmont Avenue. Um, and so that's where everything will be, except maybe for Katerina's office hours, she is, uh, I think often around Evans Hall, if that's what you're accustomed to, uh, where you're accustomed to going for, for the econ department, of course, and she'll be setting that later. Right now, again, she's on video conference. Uh, so the Memorial Stadium there is the thing at the top of the, of the picture, and we are down here, and I think I made this map back before this uh, big, you know, where, where it says Cheat is actually, of course, now a gigantic new building, as you may have noticed. They get everything up here, honestly. That's like the coolest building I've ever seen. I mean, this building's pretty cool too, but that, that one is just insane. Questions about this, about where we are physically? It's actually a house, um, and the joke here is that the, the muscle car is not required. You don't have to arrive at one of these. Uh, this is the picture from Google Street View, and it's this old house, uh, which is a really fun, fun history, it turns out. It was a house with family living in it, and it was built, I think, before 1910, if I remember right. And so if you're bored someday, I'll, I'll tell you the whole story about that, but it's pretty boring. Optional sections. Uh, those are your best friend if you're having a tough time with the material. And these will be happening on several Fridays and Mondays throughout the term in the 2232 uh, Piedmont Avenue Conference Room, and the exact times will be set uh, uh, upcoming. So for those times, uh, see the course calendar, which is hyperlinked here in the slides, if you, if you, uh, if you have the slides. Um, and the first optional section will be Friday on January 31st. So those are occasional, and then the, the office hours are your, are, your, are your BFFs. They're around forever. And if you want to uh, ask a question in person, it's kind of the best way of getting it answered. Uh, please see the office hour schedules for the exact times and places, and, and here's a list. So my office hours are going to be uh, before class, 11 to noon, and then a quick break for, uh, for scarfing down some lunch, and then on to this class. Katerina will be by appointment and video conference. Felipe is Tuesday, 5 to 7, for those uh, of you sort of mid after, late afternoon, early evening, night owls. Andrea, 10 a.m. to noon, uh, also in, I think, in the tea room, right? Yeah. 
the the tea room is also in the the building over there, and it's you go in the main door, and immediately on your right is the conference room, and on your left is walk down the hall, and it's the tea room. Uh, and then Leslie is also, I think, going to be in the tea room after class t uh, today, uh, also, and typically on Tuesdays, two to four p.m. Questions so far? Okay. All right. Uh, so. The details of the format of the class are, of course, in the syllabus. Uh, most people don't, don't usually read all the syllabus. I don't really blame you. We're all busy people. I, I suggest, though, that you download it and have it you know, for keyword searching. That's kind of the best thing for us all to be doing these days. And I'll touch on the, the big points uh, right now. So, so here, here's kind of the big story. Uh, red and green, right? It's holiday colors. Uh, red on the, on the left. We're going to start with the kind of the macroeconomics of this course. Um, and then after the midterm, we're going to go into the, the microeconomics of the course. So if you have a sense of which of those two that you're typically better at, that may give you some insight into maybe which you need to be sort of studying more or less, right? If you're, when I was your age, I was sort of a big macro guy and I didn't really get any of the micro stuff at all. Uh, and to be honest, it actually wasn't until I came here and was a graduate student instructor for this course that I really got a lot of the, the micro. Um, that, that's the magic of this, is that we're going we're to do both. And I think you'll find that you've, you've seen a lot of this stuff. Uh, thinking of a worse euphemism there for the material. <laughs> a lot of this is fairly cut and dry, you know, sort of boring stuff from Econ 101. It's 100B, I think, is macro, right? 100A and 100B. So you've seen it, or you have to, if you're an econ major. If, if you're not an econ major, well, you don't have to. That might be a very good reason not to be an econ major. I don't know. I, we all kind of get through it, and you know, sometimes the models are extremely dry. Here they aren't. Here you, there's actually a point to, to looking at this stuff. And it's really cool. It was the, for the first time I sort of realized, well, there's a reason to actually kind of think about this stuff for, for reasons that matter for people. It's not just you know doing acrobatics in your head to convince the recruiters that you, they should hire you and you should make lots of money and all that. It's actually for some real purpose. So that's going to happen both in the first part of the class and the second part of the class. The, the, probably the, the main thing is that you know, we'll talk about these other things, the grand theories as they're up here, but it, it's the neoclassical growth model is, is what I kind of think about whenever I think about the first half of the class. And that's fancy words for saying it's the solo growth model, which you probably have seen if, in 100B. Uh, of course, population and environment is the other big thing. So I guess the it's it's the it's, there's a international. So Trump is actually on trial, right? But he's actually at this meeting in Davos, Switzerland, I guess, where he's like saying, "Oh, flim flam, dippity dam, you know, like, climate change doesn't matter, all that, right?" And then the what's her head, the Greta person, who's like 17, is there saying, "Yeah, it does matter." And, you know. So that's here, and we'll be talking about that, and it's relevant. Uh, and there's a lot of important things that, that population scientists have to say about this, and it's sort of an obvious one, right? Is well, why is the world warming? Oh, it's just natural, normal, right? It has nothing to do with people. <laughs> so there you are, right? It's people. And so population scientists obviously have something to say about that. In the, the second part, then, we're going to get into these very, well, I mean, they're, you know, they're always stylized, right, these models. But a very compact way of thinking about things that really matter to us, like whether it's fertility or marriage and the family. I've been thinking a lot about this fertility choice thing. Uh, you know, for me personally, honestly, you know, what, what determines what your family size is? Well, there are constraints. And, and I know my spouse and I feel very constrained right now with how many children we can actually afford. Uh, that's what we'll be talking about, the, the choices that you make based on the constraints you face. And I think the, you know, what's swirling around right now, if you're a big Twitter user like I am, I just love that thing, is that uh, you, could, you could talk about the choices and you know, making more choices available to people, whether it's you know, working mothers or working fathers or other people. You know, of course, you have to be working to have any you know, people care about you, apparently, that sort of thing. right? You always have to be working something. And <laughs> if you're not working, nobody cares about you. Uh, so. So we, we care about choices, but of course it's important not to abstract from the fact that, that economics is about choice under constraint. It's not just choice. I mean, some people, I guess, just get to choose whatever they do, like the current occupant in the White House. So most of us don't. We actually face constraints. Uh, that's, that's what that part is all about. Um, I think a lot of you may also find the, the part on migration extremely interesting for obvious reasons. Um, and we'll talk about unauthorized immigration, which 
had been a very hot topic up until, I guess, I'm not even sure. I mean, so is it, does anybody know, let me, let me phrase it this way. Does anybody know somebody who has DACA status? Yeah, so a number of us do. DACA is Deferred Action for uh, Child Arrivals, D-A-C-A. And I think that's still in the courts right now. Um, but DACA is legal status for people who came here as minors. So they are unauthorized immigrants. Uh, so that's kind of on the horizon. What is going to happen to DACA? Uh, to DACA, uh, what, 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 what will one say? For us DACA students, I guess, but for people who hold DACA status. Uh, so we'll talk about that. But of course, there are a ton of other topics with the economics of immigration to talk about, whether it's the motivations for immigrating, uh, whether it's the the impacts of immigration on the receiving country is usually what we think about and see in the news these days, of course, uh, is being sort of self-centered as Americans tend to be about this sort of thing, right? I mean, you know, there, there's immigration all over the world, but we typically are kind of a receiving country, and so that sort of takes center stage, even though there's a bunch of other topics as well. Questions about what we're going to cover? Anything? Can you tell I'm jazzed to be here? I love this class. <laughs> And I hope you do too. I, I hope you'll see how cool it is. It's just fun. It's, it's, it's not like another typical econ course. And it's also not like uh, demography courses that sometimes can be a little mathy and not uh, substantive. I mean, it's, yeah, anyway, we'll, I, I think you'll, you'll see if you stay tuned. Okay, so the key documents are, uh, there's the syllabus, mostly just policies, links, procedures, also some prereq uh, information. There's the course calendar and uh, other Guides are there, and all of these are also available through B courses linked to one another. Let me go ahead and talk about what will make your uh, your grade, what 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 uh, what your grade consists of. So, class attendance, we're going to do eye clickers, um, and the way eye clickers work uh, is you just get a, a, as cheap an eye clicker as you can, the one with the the five buttons on it, um, an eye clicker plus, I think is what they're called. Um, and, you know, get, get it sometime. Don't worry about rushing out uh, or buying it on Amazon right now or anything if you don't want to. But we will use eye clickers, uh, and uh, I'll say more about that in a second. Uh, yeah, I need to flesh out the policy a little bit better here. But it, my, my aim with this is to be flexible. So if, you're, if you have to miss several classes because you're sick or whatever it is, that's fine. It's not going to affect your participation grade. And it's not about correct answers or incorrect answers of eye clickers. It's all about taking part in making a very large you know, lecture hall experience like this actually be meaningful for all of us, including myself, <laughs> to be honest. But a lot of it is, is really for everybody to kind of, is a, is a way of me checking in to see what really is working, what isn't, that sort of thing. Uh, so there are 11 labs on our studio that we'll talk about more uh, in a bit. And these will be also graded in a fairly lenient fashion Meaning if you did it, you get a check or full credit for it. If you do an amazing job with a bunch of extra verbiage, then, then you get a check plus and you know, that kind of thing. If you, if you point out cool things that we could have done, you get a check plus plus or something. If you turn in sort of a partial thing, you get a check minus. If you don't turn it in, you get a zero. You, you will get to drop two of those out of the 11 uh, if in case you are sick or otherwise, that sort of thing. Then a midterm and a final, and those will be old school uh, because well, that's where we are in 2020 still. Uh, so there'll be uh, written exams in class and during final week, and we'll give you examples of what kinds of things we typically ask about uh, a bit later. Final overall course grades are going to be curved. Uh, in a class this big, that's typically what you want, and it's because that means you're not on the hook for getting whatever it is, 80% or more of the points in order to actually earn a B because sometimes we write extremely hard exams. Um, so that, what that means is we look at, at everybody's performance and we look at the histogram of it and we figure out sort of where grades ought to be uh, based on this histogram. And you know, folks who aren't able to complete the stuff will typically get low grades and they might end up with a C or something like that or worse. Uh, if you do the work and, and are a, a typical student, you're going to get something in the range of a B. If you do extremely good work, you'll get something like an A or an A plus or something like that. Uh, let me, are there questions about that? Sometimes, especially for folks new to to you know to Cal, it may seem a little bit strange. If if there are, feel free to email me or come and talk about it in office hours. And so, my promise to you about grades: full transparency. I'll always tell you exactly what's going on. I always believe that saying. Everything that we're doing is the best way uh, to uh, 
to make you feel confident in, in what's going on. So if you have a question, please just ask. <clears throat> okay, eye clickers. Eye clickers are, are really fun, they're really great. They do cost money, but there is no textbook for the course, so you could think about that. Uh, they typically hold their resale value better, I think, than textbooks typically do. The worst you can do, right, is it's like a new car, is like you go buy a new textbook, and then you sell it back, right, and the thing has lost all of its value or something. I mean, that's, that's tough stuff. So eye clickers are not free. Uh, you want to get an eye clicker plus just the cheapest kind you can find. Uh, there are going to there are going to be no wrong answers with the eye clicker questions, and it's humbly meant only to enhance your learning uh, via engagement. Trust me, it's a lot of work for me to do it. It's it's worth it for all of us. And the one point, just to say, and it's sort of a no brainer, but you know, please don't bring somebody else's eye clicker and click it to get their participation credit. If we see that going on, we, everybody will be docked. It's a violation of the honor code. It's sort of this thing to say. Uh, if you Google UC Berkeley iClicker, the first hit is this page at, uh, at DLS, which tells you something about how to do this. You just need the cheapest, uh, most basic iClicker Plus remote, the one uh, with five multiple choice buttons marked A through E. The student store typically has them. I, I haven't checked. I'm s uh, sorry, I will when I get a chance. Uh, Amazon has them, maybe Craigslist. Any old way you can get one, it doesn't really matter. If it's your friends and you're worried about it being registered to your friend, it doesn't matter. All that goes away. It, it get, gets registered to one person. So you typically can't share an eye clicker at the same time. But what you can do is just give it to a friend. They'll use it. And then they give it back to you once they're done, that kind of thing. Um, I wish I had put this up here. I did not. Uh, we are, if you, you can try, <laughs> I don't think it's a good idea, using the, the mobile app uh, for eye clicker. And the reason I don't think it's a good idea is it is explicitly spelled out on the help pages here that these things are very unreliable on Wi-Fi networks in rooms this big. You typically use iClickers with large numbers of students. The problem is that you have to have a very robust Wi-Fi to get all the, the clicks basically measured off your smartphone. So you can attempt it, but we don't have any support to help you um, with that. And I guarantee that if you just buy an iClicker Plus, it will work and you won't have to worry about it. So if you want to try the, uh, the mobile app, I suppose we could give that a shot, but my suggestion is not to do that. Questions about iClicker? OK. So we've got a really big classroom. We'd like to have it as, as active as possible. We'd like to run some activities during the term that kind of help you know, shake things up and show the, the points we're trying to make uh, by explaining. Uh, please raise your hand and ask a question. Shout it out if you feel like, as long as other you know, folks aren't all shouting at the same time. Uh, and please tell me if I'm too fast or unclear or too, or too quiet, uh, if you're falling asleep, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, so some don'ts for the classroom. Uh, cell phones on mute, please. And then let's talk about laptops. And a whole bunch of you are using laptops. So my view on that is that you know people learn in different ways. If you like to use a laptop when you're learning, that's that's fine. Um, if you like to use a laptop or a smartphone to zone out or to like you know follow the Twitter feed of the impeachment hearings or whatever it is that you like to do, I understand. And and please please don't do that. Uh, if you're falling asleep, ask a question. Take a breather outside. And fi finally, I, I apologize. So I'm dying here, but my cough drop is obviously much too big for my mouth. Uh, please be aware that there actually are randomized controlled trial studies that look at this question of whether laptops are good or bad for the, for the classroom. And guess what? It turns out they're bad. They're bad. Uh, why are they bad? It's, it's a classic e economics topic. It's, there's an externality, a negative externality for all of your neighbors behind you, not in front of you. Who see your screen? And if you're, you know, if you're taking notes, that, you know, but people aren't taking notes on the laptops, right? <laughs> so please keep that in mind. I've always been uh, of the mind that, you know, um, unless there's some really egregious problem in the classroom, I'm not going to police it that much. So if if people start complaining about laptop use and people watching movies and how it's distracting them, I'm going to intervene. But uh, absent that, we're all adults, right? Uh, but just please be aware of this. If if you like. To, to watch movies in your laptop, I, I, then I think you shouldn't bother coming to class, number one. If you have to come to class and watch movies in your laptop, go to the back of the room so nobody else is, is distracted by it. 
Okay, any, any questions about that? It's funny stuff, right? But it actually, sadly, is rather clear that the things have this distracting influence. The, the problem is, though, I, there, you know, is anybody taking data eight here at Berkeley? Yeah, so some of you have. So data eight is the data science class, the foundations of data science. And when you walk in there, are, are people banned from using laptops? No, right? The entire class is about using laptops and coding all the time. So the modern classroom, we've got to find some way of sort of mixing these things. And anyway, so that's my policy. If, uh, if it becomes a problem, we'll do something about it. Otherwise, go ahead and use them. But please be aware of this, that they can be very distracting. Okay. So most weeks, we're going to have computing labs. Those are the only, if you like, weekly assignments here. Uh, so we have the, the midterm and final exams, and then also the labs. And those are the requirements other than participation with eye clicking. And we're going to be using the R programming language uh, in a way that should be very accessible to you. Now, when I asked who had taken data eight, I think I saw only about 10 hands or so. If you've taken data eight or if you know somebody who has or a data science connector course or something, then this format will be maybe a little more familiar to you. I'm gonna show it to you in a second. But it's, it's kind of the new you know, 21st century way of learning how to code. It sits in a web browser and uh, a sort of good uh, you know, teaching style is to have enough comments that make it clear what you're doing and allow students to figure out when they read a question or something and they see a code fragment or maybe a complete amount of code that they've run and then can take that, copy it, augment it a little bit and make it work uh, to do whatever they need to do. Uh, it's a pretty good way of learning. I wish it had been around uh, 25, 30 years ago when I was in your shoes. So I think, I think you're going to like it. I also think that there will be folks who, who don't like it. Um, and if you don't like it, then you need to come and, and talk about it in office hours with us, and we'll, we'll try to help you. You can also reach out to other students. Uh, uh, this is coming up, too. You absolutely collaborate on these things. You need to write up your own answers and also report whom you are collaborating with on these. And then collaboration is absolutely fine. Um, let me say, too, something about you know, answers and copying and things like that. Copying code is how we learn to code. Copying words is how we get sent to the principal's office, right? So we can go into greater depth about that if you're not, if you're not sure about that, but copying code is one thing. That's how we all learn how to code. Copying words and thoughts and ideas is, is no, not good. That's not what we're going to be doing. Um, and, and we will be looking for that. If you're, if you're concerned about it, please, please talk to me. Okay, so if you, if you, haven't, if you don't know R uh, or you haven't had statistics, and between you and me, I, I, I'm, I'm fluent in Stata. I know R somewhat. And this is going to work for a person like me. It's going to work for somebody who's not had any programming experience at all. So uh, don't sweat this, but it is true also that if, if programming is new to you, please try to tackle this head on as soon as you can. Uh, to, uh, to really be able to, to grapple this out of the gate. So the goal of, of the labs is to learn the concepts uh, in economic demography through the manipulation of, of data, basically. That's another reason why this is so magical. Uh, you know, back when I was in college and, and uh, in the Stone Age, right, we didn't actually have our hands on data as much. And this is a method to really bring data into the classroom into your, uh, your homework, your weekly cadence of stuff that you do. OK. Uh, so we'll look at this in a second after I just say a few more things. So there are 11 different labs that you will see once you fire up our studio. Uh, we're not going to accept late submissions. We've got to keep the class moving forward. Uh, so if, if you're late, the first one is due Wednesday the 30th, right? That's next Wednesday. Uh, it, I'm sorry, the 29th, Wednesday the 29th. Um, but we will drop your two lowest. So uh, if, if somebody is a late entrant to the class, for example, and can't make the first one, that's fine. If you're sick, that's fine too. If, if something really drastic happens and you need to miss more than two, you'll have to come see me in my, in my office hours. And then here's our policy too, again, about, about collaboration is absolutely fine. Please write up your own answers by yourself. So, you know, uh, Writing up in English, that means you write it yourself. You have to take the ideas. You can discuss it with other people, but please use your own words, and you can absolutely collaborate. 
Okay, so the first lab is due in a, a week from tomorrow uh, at midnight, and the labs generally be, will be due on Wednesdays at midnight. And it will be available, it, and I think all the other labs actually, will be available when you log in uh, to the RStudio server uh, in, in the files pane. And the point is uh, to introduce you to the computing system and to think a little bit about exponential growth and population, population history, and then I'll ultimately some optimal population theory sorts of things. Okay, and before we take, we'll take a quick look at this in class, uh, provided of course that the Wi-Fi is robust <laughs> enough to let me do that. Uh, so everybody who was registered uh, should have received an automatic email with a temporary password and instructions. If you haven't seen it, check your inbox, check your junk mail inbox as well. If you still haven't received it, uh, then please uh, check the external website and, and click on this. Uh, th there's a link that says request in our studio account, which will take you to a Google form that you can fill out with your name and email address. And please get in touch with me by Friday uh, with any problems uh, with the account. Okay, any questions about the RStudio stuff before I quickly show it to you? Okay, so let me pop out of this and go over to Chrome. So the, I've, I've worked for data science, and I, I wasn't using Chrome up, up until uh, I, I, I did. Let's see where this screen is. There it is. Okay. And so I got there, and like you know, everybody was using Chrome, and I felt like such a you know <laughs> such a loser for not using Chrome. So I just switched over to Chrome. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is this is what you'll see. Maybe what we should do too. I wonder if I've got the you know, there's there's this main website, and I admit it's it's a little hard to remember this. Um, the B courses link should also take you there, and here, if I click on B courses, that should pull up uh, this web page, uh, the B courses web page, in a new in a new window. And I think there's the external course website, so I could just spend all my time clicking back and forth and pulling up a million windows of both of these if I felt like it. So that's where we came from. Uh, to to launch our studio, then you can act, you can type in if you like the URL directly, or start typing a course in your Chrome browser, <laughs> Chrome. And, and it'll just take you there, and then that's what it looks like. It's a little intimidating, to be frank. There's a lot of words here. Um, the left-hand side is where uh, a lot of the action is, and then the right-hand side shows you all these, these pre-populated files. One of the magic things about, about this and about data science education is the way that, that the pre-populated files work. So when you log in, all of these should already be there. And of course, you'll see, and I know this is a little bit small for those in the back, but you'll see one of the funny little uh, quirky things here is that uh, here's lab number one, and if I click on it, it will pull up lab one over on the left-hand side. And we'll talk more about that in a second. And there's two, three, four, five, six, no lab seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, no lab 12, and 13. So I apologize for that. It's because of the, you know, the idiosyncrasies of the academic calendar. Um, spring break, I think, is basically what that is. On the left-hand side, uh, there is uh, w there are words that walk you through what it is and what we're doing, um, and uh, it's it's designed to be fairly verbose. Um, this is the first lab of of Econ Demog 175. A goal. Here are the goals. Uh, the document is written in our mark markdown. Um, that might be familiar to you if you've taken data eight. Uh, Markdown is kind of the new thing. Uh, so it's not the prettiest, but it absolutely gets the, world done, uh, gets the work done for you, and it should be fairly self-explanatory. Questions about this? Okay. Anybody uh, have a, any challenges with accessing our studio? Yes. That's, that's a really good question. How, how are you submitting a problem set? Yeah. Um, did, so did everybody get that? I wonder if I've got that in my slides here. Um, I think, okay. There is a part of the website, let me go back here. Uh, and so this is a very lengthy answer to that question, how to, how to do this. Um, well, I'm, I'm trying to remember which one's which. One, one's a little bit briefer, one's very lengthy. I guess this is not so lengthy but there's still a lot of words here. So let me just tell you that having, having pointed out that 
there are answers for questions like this is a very good question. There are answers that we've tried to sort of set up for you. Uh, uh, but a, sort of a more straightforward one is, and let's go back to our studio. Suppose you were running stuff. Oh, and here's, let's see if I can just hit the play button here and add 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. Um, so that's a pretty banal sort of thing that you probably wouldn't want to copy and paste into a document. But what I suggest that you do is take your favorite word processor like Microsoft Word and have it open here. I think it's going to turn up on my screen down here, so I'll just bring this over uh, to say that, you know, so what I think you would do is compose your problem set as you go using the output of, of our studio. So if you were putting into something, you know, qu question one asks, what is 2 plus 2? And the answer is 4. <laughs> it's not 5, right? It's, that's the George Orwell quote about, <laughs> about fascism. I've been thinking a lot about that the last three years. Um, and you might want to spell check since I screwed this up. But then what you might do is, is save this as a PDF file. And I think that's what uh, Gradescope, so I'm going to say this in the microphone, I think that's what Gradescope needs as a PDF. There it is. So that's what you want to do. You want to basically use our studio to inform your answers to things. Other questions about our studio? Okay, well, I bet there will be as soon as you guys dive in. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Oh, yes. Sure, if it works for you. I've been trying to do that myself. The question is, are we allowed to knit on R into a PDF? And I think that's in the file, right? Um, knit document? Yeah, I, I was playing around with it, and I, oh, well, it seems to have done something, like create a new, this, this HTML output. If, if you're cool with that, and it works, then great, yeah. Personally, I've not played around with it that much. And in, in discussions about this, I gather that kind of the primary way students usually did this was to just create a separate document. But if you're, if you're more R savvy and want to do that, I think that's right. Yeah, Our, so we do have, in addition to us, uh, also Carl Bow is running tech support behind the scenes. And he, uh, among other things he asked me to say, with 300 students, it's well possible we could crash this, by the way. If we crash it, email me. Um, and he was talking about knitting. So it sounds like, <laughs> sounds funny, right? Why not? <laughs> knitting stuff. Knitting a document using the file menu command. So if you're, if you're cool with that and it produces what you want, then that's great. Um, the nice thing, if you use Microsoft Word or some other sort of, you know, what you see is what you get kind of thing, then you can always monkey with it in perhaps an easier way than one might find in our studio. Other questions? Do folks want me to step through? Yeah, I'm sorry. Question in the front. That's a really good question. So she says, so your, your server might crash. Can we use an offline version of R? Sure. You're on your own. So I'm sorry, but, but if you want to do that, yes, you can use your own version of R or R Studio or whatever it is that you like or... I'm trying to remember what I what's it's even called. I mean, I've got something on here too. Um, yeah, I've got a I've got a local version of our studio myself. You can do that. The problem is that you know you need to figure out a way to, of importing the data and also the R Markdown file and all that. So if you want to, by all means, go ahead and do that. It's just that it may be a lot of extra work. Um, is is that clear to everybody? You can use anything you like. It's just that here with our studio. Uh, sorry, let me get back to. Oops. Yeah, with our so this is all right here for you. Everything is right there. The data are right there. The R markdown that steps you through what to do and also asks the questions. Everything is right there for you. And you can also do it on a local version of our studio or something like that. Other questions? Do you think there'll be witnesses? I just, I can't stop thinking about it. Are there going to be witnesses or not, right? <laughs> well, who needs witnesses? He's obviously innocent, right? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, midterm in the final. Uh, so 
I haven't done a good job of explaining what these are going to look like, and I will do a better job later. We'll look at some past uh, exams. Um, and you know, they're going to be long form sorts of things. We're, we'll be looking for short answers uh, to questions that you know, explain in language kind of the concepts that we're trying to, to, uh, to talk about here. We'll, we'll have the, the final exam during the regular exam time, which is on the calendar. It covers the whole semester, emphasizes the second half, which is, again, the, the, the micro models of things. So there are these traditional resources. We talked about the, the five human beings who were involved in the class, and you've met three of us, and two more will be back uh, when they're physically here. Office hours and optional sections. Uh, also, uh, you know, there are written uh, resources to have access to. The readings show up on the course calendar, which is a Google Sheets document. Now that I'm saying that, let me just go ahead and click over and, and, and make sure we see that. Um, okay. Course, cal course calendar with readings, and if you click that, it'll take you to this shared file, and you'll see that there is something here. Um, this isn't as slick as it could be, because if something is on B courses, I think it just plops you into the B courses page. So I'm going to click on that, and I think we've got the readings right here. There it is, the SOVI reading for Thursday. Okay. Would, should, does anybody like me to do that again? I think it's fairly self-explanatory. If you start either with B courses or with the external website, you'll find your way through this. Yes, question. That's a great question. Uh, let me see if I can summarize everything. When are office hours, uh, with whom and where, and how do they work, and how do sections work? Did I, is that, is that it? Okay, so, so here's another link uh, on, a, on the external website. Office hours calendar will pull up a, another Google Sheet, and it, it links to uh, where office hours are. So Leslie's gonna have some right after class. I'm also available after class to, to chat. Um, these are, the, these are the office hours. For sections, those happen uh, more sporadically, so we haven't made a separate schedule other than the course calendar. I think we'll have that in there. Let me go back and look at the course calendar again. So we haven't, we haven't put times on here, but the, the things in red are the optional sections. So I'll, I'll, we'll get you those details about when those rooms are scheduled for those. Uh, we currently have four different weeks of optional sections, either on Fridays or Mondays. And it's because big topics get introduced and we have noticed that students uh, can really use the extra help during those weeks. For the rest of the time, we suggest that you come to office hours. Was, was that clear? Other questions? Okay. Copies of lecture slides are also on the external uh, website. That's where they get posted. Yes, question. Uh, for the reading, yeah. Uh, can often be done by lecture? Is it like that? Yeah, if you could read the readings uh, for that day beforehand, so have them read. That's right. So here, back at the course calendar, we're looking at, yeah, if you, if you could have this reading done by Thursday, that's the best. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's the correct answer, or correct response, I guess, you know. Nobody's, you know, checking you, <laughs> making sure that you're not looking in the, at the internet or something and reading your, the readings. But it's best that you you get the most out of it if you know what's coming, having done the readings. How should you read in in college, though? Do you, do you ever read every word of the thing? No, no, goodness, no. So I, when I was a freshman, I showed up to college and I I took notes. I read every single word and I spent a ridiculous amount of time on that. You don't do that. What what you do is you look at the document, you look at the title. That usually tells you something. And then you skip to the end and read if there's a conclusion. And then you read some of the beginning, and then you skim through and look at the graphics and the tables, right? That sort of thing. So, but, but the point is that to, it's best to do that before you come to class in which it's being discussed. Other questions? So lecture slides will also be on the external uh, website. 
Okay, so a few other things about uh, then the e-resources. The, the departmental uh, external website we've talked about. So Piazza is the best thing ever. <laughs> it really is. It, it, it wasn't around uh, a while ago. And, and I, you know, it's kind of a badge of honor, actually, that it's, to this day on the Piazza homepage is a picture of Ron Lee, who used to teach this class, talking about how great it was for a class like this, a very large class where... You know, it's it's easy to lose something. I mean, I, I'm revved up, amped up. I'm, you know, probably taking too much cold medicine, and I, you might not catch everything that I say. That'll be helped by having a video of the class, and you can look at that. But it's also helped a lot just by reaching out on Piazza and asking a question. Uh, I think most folks knew what Piazza was, so I probably shouldn't have even spent the extra breath there talking about it. Are there any uh, are there any questions about Piazza? Should we just have a quick look? Let's have a quick look. Why not? Uh, going back over to Chrome, let's look at our, so here's a quick link to the Piazza page, and let's see what happened. Okay, so I know I answered this one, and yep, so there, there I am. <laughs> I answered it. We check it. We do. Now, we're not going to check it every hour, uh, but we will check it a bunch, especially this first week. So Piazza is super cool. Please use Piazza. Grade scope is where you, you turn in the labs. It's also uh, where the lab grades, in addition to B courses, would be posted. Um, and uh, there's a grade scope guide here that you can click on. There's also a link on the external web page itself. OK. So before I talk about the topics and try to energize you about being here and telling you all the cool stuff we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks, are there any other questions about logistics? Who do we go to about waitlist questions? So my understanding is that waitlisting actually is a completely automatic thing now here at Berkeley. Uh, if you have a specific question about that, email me. But my answer is likely to be it's automatic. And you know the waitlist takes slots, and it fills them out on the first come, first served out of the waitlist. Uh, that's a really good question. Is, is there a number off the wait list who will get into the class? All I can tell you is that my recollection, and I, I'm hoping Leslie might correct me if I'm wrong about this because she's been here a lot in the last several years helping with the class, is that students on a wait list typically get into the class. And she's nodding her head. Yeah. So I don't have any numbers to tell you, but you know, with a class of with 300 seats, there's a lot of churn. And people do class shopping, and uh, you know they might not need the units. And so I think what we will find is that enough folks will probably uh, drop the class, and people off the wait list will be uh, allowed in. Um, if there are concurrent enrollment students uh, here present, that's the same story, I would say. I don't really have anything specific to say other than uh, the, pol the Department of Policies are to fill the seats with the uh, regular uh, registered Berkeley students first, and then concurrent enrollment students who will be fully served on a first come, first serve kind of thing after that. Other questions? I'm the person you should ask about general things, uh, you know, administrative stuff and all that. Uh, feel free, of course, to ask about course material of also the GSIs. Um, and you know, if you ask them an administrative thing, they will they will send it to me again. So you can just ask me directly. Okay. All right, what is this class about? Census 2020. Is there anything more controversial and more important? Well, yeah, of course. It's like every day is more controversial and more important than the previous day, right? And that's been true since January 20th, 2017, 20, what was that? 2017, right? <laughs> I remember our, our daughter was born three months, two months before the election. My wife said, can we wait to give birth to her just after all this is done. And I said, no, it doesn't work that way. She's already out. So, <laughs> but she doesn't remember any of this, right? That's the best part. It's like, you and I, we know everything that's happening, and we're just appalled. <laughs> and she has no clue. She's three. She has no clue. And that, that, that helps me sleep at night. So is there anything more controversial, more important than the census? Of course there is. Every day there's a more controversial and important thing. Uh, so census day is this term. It's, it's so cool. It's in between two class meetings. And you will be on a census form somewhere, every one of you. It turns out 
even if you're a foreign student, if you are living here, resident, you will be on a United States Census form. Everybody will be. What, now, what details do they collect? And the answer is not a ton. It's things like your age, your self-reported uh, ethnicity, your uh, national origin, I think, is probably also on there. I don't know yet. I haven't looked at it. But this is really interesting because we are going to see this play out. Of course, we won't see the data for another uh, maybe a maybe a full calendar year. I don't I don't really know the release date cycle there, uh, but this is critical information. Uh, you know, these days we're always talking about what's called big data, for lack of a better term. It's, that term's been around for maybe ten years or something like that. But uh, for those of you who are you know juniors and seniors looking on to careers, you probably are fully aware that if you just say those two words in a job interview, everybody will look at you and say, well, "What do you know about big data? Can you help us with big data?" You'll be like, "Oh, of course I can." I used our studio and Econ 175. I know how to do that. Well, the thing about big data, it just generically refers to data that, that people collect uh, from all of us. And guess, guess how? Right? Every time you use this for anything, if there's at least one company collecting data on what you're doing. And, you know, there are privacy policies. You know, Apple, you know, is at least up to now one of the best companies in terms of actually keeping your data you know, private and not at least getting busted selling it to everybody. So why am I saying all this right now? Here's the thing about big data. So you've got a whole bunch of cell phone users and you're tracking their movements all over the globe. How do you know if that's representative of anything? It could just be representative of that particular company's customer base. How do you know? And the answer is you know using census data. That's where it all comes from. And there are different flavors of census data, of course. There are different surveys. The, the census is one thing that everybody actually participates in. Everything else is based on a uh, random subsample of the 300, whatever we are, 340, 330 million people uh, in, in the country. Census data is extremely important. Uh, and of course, we know that the sort of political salience stuff is, is sort of there. Uh, so the BLS, uh, with the Census Bureau, conducts the monthly current population survey that gives us the unemployment rate. That's the thing that's in the news all the time. And the Census Bureau also conducts this decennial census, and the census records go public after 70 years-ish, roughly. The, the census of 1940 came out in about 2013, if I remember right. And so we will see the census 1950 records coming out uh, not too long from now. And of course, if you've been paying attention, the 2020 census has been a little controversial. It's hard, it's hard to remember, though, right? Because a lot of this controversy was actually playing out. I think over the over the summer. I think the Supreme Court finally ruled. I think I think in July or in June. I think they usually rule about this sort of thing. Well, they, they do all their rulings usually in June. And uh, or gosh, you know, it might have been like a special ruling because they knew that this was important to get to because the census is happening already in Alaska right now. And there was this big fight over, including a question on the census about citizenship, which sounds like almost like a, a silly fight to have. But the problem is, it has not been asked about of every citizen, not since 1950. So that was the big, uh, big kerfuffle back. <laughs> not, not today, not yesterday, but it was the kerfuffle about six months ago, I guess. Um, and so. Uh, <laughs> As a result, what is happening is the, the administration is constructing data that reveals similar things using other sources and hopefully keeping it confidential. Um, what, what we put our faith in is the, the deep state of all the bureaucracies and the, sense, the folks who work at the Census Bureau, bless their hearts, keeping all this stuff restricted as it should be, and we hope that they do. Census. So get ready. It's going to be interesting. I, I love filling out this stuff. Just as a side note, um, there, we, we actually were in a survey recently. It's called the National Household Travel Study uh, that was in 2016. And I'll never forget it because my, my firstborn was in utero at the time. And we were out in Point Reyes. And we got to fill out this survey about our, our travel habits for that day and like where we went. And we self-reported our location, but I think they may also these days actually have geocoded uh, ways of, of measuring you. Right, so these things know where you are at all times. And Census Bureau questionnaires typically ask you to self-report it. 
sort of a breath of fresh air. The problem is that the, the, the big data stuff typically does not. It's, it's always, well, <laughs> privacy policy. Okay, you click that box, and so therefore we're going to measure where you are at all times. There's a whole burgeoning industry. So if any of that is striking to you, and of course, if you're an econ major, you might find it kind of neither here nor there. You don't really care that much. And that's okay, too. If you're a demography or a social major, you might find it very salient. And there's a whole subset of things to say about it. And so you, you should go check out the, the human context and ethics courses with data science that focus on this topic a ton. What else is this class about? Um, I saw this on Twitter. I'm a huge Twitter fiend. I don't know why. I don't know. I, I get everything there. You know, sports, politics, friends. I don't know. It's just fun. So these charts... And if you are a parent yourself, you're going to smile knowingly and also probably have PTSD. <laughs> These are charts about daily time allocations before baby, technically for the mom breastfeeding. Month number one, month number two, months three to four, months five to six. Here's the happy time that you guys are in right now, probably, your pre-baby. <laughs> And you've got work and commute through these hours, and you've got sleep here, and you've got what's called free time here. <laughs> Notice there is no yellow bar, month one or month two. And I, that, I think that's, that's actually <laughs> a bit optimistic, that it ends after month two. Uh, but this is, you know, somebody put this together. It's fun to look at. And what this illustrates in this fun way of just saying, well, it turns out that if you have a child, and, and you know, breastfeeding or not, this is what this is about, but... With breastfeeding or not, nursing and pumping takes up, you know, time at oh about twelve in the morning. Also at three in the morning, maybe four in the morning. These big chunks throughout your day. This is why new parents are so sleep deprived and say crazy things all the time. This is a huge time cost of having children, and of course most of it's borne by the mother of the child, but definitely not all of it. It is borne by a household too. There's a huge time cost to having children. And we haven't even started talking about the issue that arises when you think about, well, what about when you go back to work? And so this is near, near to me right now because my wife and I are both working. But then when both the kids are sick, what do you do? Well, you cannot send them to daycare because the kids are sick. And daycares and preschools you cannot use when the kids are sick. And you're back suddenly in this sort of world again uh, where you're up all night. I had to laugh. So one of my previous teaching gigs, I, I made this point about, you know, uh, sort of around the clock sort of thing. And one of the student athletes in the room just pointed out that, that they had been awake at, I don't know, like four in the morning to go to calisthenics and then doing it again, I guess, at like, I don't know, seven or was falling asleep in class. And I said, oh, really? Well, I was awake at about 11 p.m. and then about 2 a.m. and then about 4 a.m. and then about 6 a.m. So... Having children is running a marathon, and it is extremely taxing at the get-go, as some of you probably know. What are the implications of that for choices and behavior? Choices under constraints. So that we'll be turning to that uh, in the second half. Okay, so this, this is a chart that also requires some explanation. I'll read the figure titled Trump Overperformance Compared to Mitt Romney in 2012 by Drug, Alcohol, and Suicide Mortality Rate Quartile in the local area. So I think it's probably by county or something like that. And uh, the different group, there are four different groups that are uh, for the U.S. overall is this thing here at the far left. And we've got these different bars, uh, four different bars uh, that are showing you the, the lowest mortality uh, quartile here is the lightest one. The highest mortality quartile is the darkest one, and they look at not only the U.S. overall, but also some rather salient areas, right? The industrial Midwest, uh, the, again, I want to do air, air quotes, right? The industrial Midwest. What is industry in the Midwest? Well, there is some heavy industry still, but it's different. It's different than it was. Uh, and so what we're talking about is not only uh, drug, alcohol, and suicide and that, we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, reallocations of labor, to put it scientifically. Job changes, industry changes, and things like that. Here, <laughs> I love New England, right? So they, they're a little bit of an outlier, except, of course, for the, the highest mortality quartile uh, and Appalachia here. Uh, so the, the bigger the number that you get, the, the bigger the, the, the overperformance of uh, in the 2016 election of the Trump vote compared to what Romney had pulled in in 2012. 
uh, right? So McCain was 2008. Um, you know, there's kind of a, a question, of course, as to what the what the right what the right difference is here to compare. This, this is kind of like a difference in differences sort of thing. If you're accustomed to hearing that at all from other econ courses, um, so it's comparing Trump to Romney and saying that they're sort of equivalent, and then saying, well, where is it that you see the biggest overperformance? And the answer is in the highest mortality areas. Why would you see that? Is it because dead people vote for Trump? No, right? Who's left? It's the family members of all those people who have died. Uh, it's the neighbors and of, of people who have died from uh, substance abuse. Um, and the, you know, this, this has been remarked several places, but this is happening, and this is a pretty big deal. Um, it's certainly not the only thing that's happening with health and mortality. And I, I, the other thing that you know, one has not actually at all talked about race here yet, but that usually also gets mentioned, is, is that. It, if you look at the data, it, it seems to be rather heavily concentrated among white non-Hispanics in these areas. Um, and, and, and one reason I mention that is that it is also not the case that somehow uh, African Americans and Hispanics are just so well off, right? That's not true. It's just that the, one of the emerging things appears to be this. Big rises in midlife, it turns out, mortality. So right, right around my age, I'm 46. so. <laughs> Right between you know 46, it's usually 45 to 54 or something is what people will look at, and we, we will also look at that. Questions? Were people aware of this? Is this new? Okay. What else is the class about? Uh, so this is, I'm sorry for not changing the, the title, this is this last year's slide, so it's actually a 2018 New York Times article all about China's looming crisis of a shrinking population and, of course, in, in forecast. So the, the dark red is actual data, and the, the lighter stuff is actually the forecast of China's total population. So um, do we believe the forecast? I, I think you probably should. I mean, a forecast is a forecast. It's not true until it actually happens. But I, I think this is very likely to happen, and, and for reasons that we'll get into uh, a little bit in the course later. Something called the demographic transition typically does things like this to some different extent, depending on just how far fertility falls. But uh, a lot of this rapid growth earlier, dating back, of course, to 1950, and we're talking about the dawn then of the People's Republic in 1949. So prior to that, you have a lot of, uh, you know, what we would say population momentum here that were determined by uh, vital rates, death rates, and fertility rates in what became the People's Republic before that. And of course, uh, the People's Republic became known for what was called the one-child policy. And I actually don't recall when it started, but I think it was in the 70s, probably. Um, it was right around the time of the first great wave of, of concern about the environment. And uh, folks convinced the Communist Party that it was good to do this one-child policy. Well, so you might wonder, well, what is the, the best population size if, if population seems to kind of you know, fluctuate around? Um, and of course, it turns out that's a pretty nebulous sort of thing to get a grapple on, uh, but we will talk about it. And then if you, if you look at the long time series of, of population levels, and this, I apologize for how hard this is to read. It's a slide, so you can, you can stare at it on your laptop up close. The, the main thing is just that you know, here's the kind of lengthy history of the geographic area that is now China, dating back to, to zero in the common era. And it was kind of flopping around, going up and down, right? Little fluctuations not really going much either way until suddenly this great takeoff starting uh, what, around what we usually call the, the Enlightenment period in, in Europe. And there's probably a different name for this era in China. I'm not a China scholar, so I, I don't know. But it, it was about the same period of time. Uh, what was happening in human societies at this point? Um, you know, a lot was the same, but a lot of things were changing. And especially, I think what we know about is in Europe, again, I'm not a China scholar, it may well have been happening here. The other thing is that when ideas are generated in one part of the globe about how to produce food better, other parts of the globe find out about it. Um, and so whether from China or to China, these ideas are flowing, uh, you know, an escape. Uh, rising populations, an escape from, from what honestly all around the world was a pretty nasty thing to live through all of this. 
Uh, in Europe, not, not in China, but you, you can kind of see it here. Here's a famine, right? This, this big reduction right here in population. Here's another one, and then a recovery, and then another one. <laughs> Uh, a famine or probably a disease or something like that. And in, in Europe, what was happening uh, in the 14 and 1500s was the Black Death, this horrendous thing. Um, that's another thing actually in the news, uh, another coronavirus, right? Uh, in China, does anybody remember seeing about that? It, the news has been breaking very rapidly. Yeah, do you remember what province it's in? Southern China. Yeah. Yeah, and so students saying several reported dead or tens or something. I don't think it's hundreds yet. Yeah, and of course the last coronavirus was SARS, I think, that would sort of gather national attention. Um, SARS, I think, was probably 10 or 20 years ago, though. I'm trying to remember. And so you guys may not have lived through it. Um, it was kind of a scary time, but to be honest, I think the Ebola thing scares me more. I don't know. I, what scares me more? SARS or Ebola? I don't know. I think the problem with Ebola is it's a hemorrhagic fever, so you're bleeding out of everything, and that sounds awful. SARS is like a really bad cold, but the problem is that you can die of really bad colds. It's not fun. Uh, so that's kind of the, the story. Then a big break away. Now, it's, it's not, the, not as if, of course, there wasn't turmoil and problems uh, in this later stage, but it was a very different kind of disease environment, finally. In, in large part, when we're talking about the second half of the 20th century after 1950, we're talking about things like taking antibiotics. Uh, so who has not been on antibiotics in the room? <laughs> right? We've all been on antibiotics. And had we not been on antibiotics, you know, you, you probably would be in much worse shape. You might actually be dead. Uh, it's true. I, you know, so I, um, I can't remember what year this was. I, were you around, Leslie? I got pneumonia. I was teaching this class with Josh, and this was back in like 2015. Yeah, I got pneumonia, and pneumonia is, is a nasty thing. You can get through without an, uh, antibiotics, but uh, you, you kind of need that antibiotic to help you get through that. And that was actually one of the big stories, it turns out, if anybody's a Kaiser member in the room, the Kaiser shipyards and the Kaiser family, uh, Kaiser bringing health care and medical care to the shipyard workers and other people who were building the ships in World War II that just up there in Richmond, finally using antibiotics, penicillin, to, to attack pneumonia, which up until that point, it turns out that if you were in a war, there was much a much greater likelihood that you would die of a disease like pneumonia or some other communicable thing rather than getting shot and killed which is kind of scary when you think about it. These big armies, well, it turns out the biggest problem was the density and, and dying of infectious disease. Okay, uh, why are there limits to growth? Are there limits? Uh, what, what might they be? Uh, and they might be different in different eras. And so we'll talk about that uh, and the, sort of the outlook for it. We'll also talk about population age structure, and this is not at all a good uh, chart, sorry, to show the population age structure. Uh, but let, let me just ask you, you know, why is this happening? Why is there a forecast reduction in the level of the population? It's because of reductions in fertility. And so if you just think about that, it's kind of obvious, right? If, if there's a big reduction in the number of babies that, that a population is having, what happens to the population? Does it get older or younger? So I, I should probably just restate it. It probably went by very quickly. If there's a big reduction in the number of babies that the country is having, what happens to the country? Does it get older or younger? It gets older, right? Yeah. That's, that's the, the story here. Um, and populations can get older or get younger, uh, you know, sort of over, this, over the transition, it turns out. And so we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay, well here, yeah, I should have just looked ahead. So this is, is sort of like a, an age structure kind of thing. It, it's, it's looking at um, the, the proportions of the Chinese population uh, in these different broad age groups. So more than 64, or sometimes it's 65 and over, uh, is a, it's a marker that we still choose to this day. Uh, one has to laugh a little bit. So it, it, it turns out, so all of us in this room, we will not get our full Social Security benefits until age 67 or possibly beyond. It used to be 65. That was why 65 is kind of this number that people use a lot. Um, 
I think the funny thing there is in some European countries, you can actually get full pension benefits at more like ages like 60. So you might want to move to Europe to retire if you want. I don't know. It, it seems kind of a cool thing to me. So what this is showing us is that it's, it's kind of a big explosion in the folks that are, are in retirement age that's going on in China. Is that a, a challenge? Um, well, it turns out it is because workers are pretty useful things to have. Um, in retirement, where does your money come from? You're not working, so it comes from your assets, like a bank account or like stocks or other things like that. And one of the big reveals in economics is that the only reason that your stocks or bank account has value is because other workers are actually using that, we usually call it capital, financial capital, to do something. If there are fewer workers to actually use your capital to do something, uh, you're out of luck. So this is a real problem for, for pretty much every society that's, that's looking at it. Uh, here's a story about also Chinese fertility. Uh, this, it turns out, it was a famine. Uh, and famines tend to do things like this, like reduce fertility a ton. They also tend to kill people the old-fashioned way rather than sort of, you know, uh, you know deborn them, I guess, or something, if you like. You can also have more miscarriages and awful things like that. Um, so uh, a big uh, increase then afterward, but now the, the projection is to something that's, that's below, uh, I think this must be replacement, it would be the zero. Like, oh, I see, annual population growth is what we're talking about. Um, so you know, it's, it's really a story about fertility. And it's, it's not just China, it's also Japan, it's Korea and other places. Other topics too, why marry? Who chooses whom? That's a fun uh, set of things to do. Does migration hurt the native born? Uh, does it help the native born? And the answer might surprise you. Why migrate? Does development speed or slow migration? And if you look at the, the class calendar, uh, so we will be um, out for this week of the population association meeting. So there'll be sort of an extra spring break, if you will, for this class um, during, during this week. I think it's week 13. Finally, why do some people live longer than others? And I'll, I'll just sort of include a pitch here. What we're going to do there is a little health, health economics. And if you enjoy hearing the sound of my voice, you can take a summer class in health economics. I'll be teaching here at Berkeley for more econ credit if you're interested. So with that said, are there any questions about where we're headed? I've got, I've got eight minutes, actually, so I'm going to keep going. If you need to head off to your next class, by all means do so. But please try to keep the sound to a minimum. Questions about where we're going? OK. So let's talk a little bit about world population and world population growth. What we'll see is that the growth rate uh, in world population itself, the growth rate is um, the percentage change in world population. The growth rate itself has actually been growing. More to the point, though, the actual average annual change in the number of people, that's the level change or the difference, if you like, in population over time, has been growing a ton. Uh, so what are models all about? Models are about looking for things that look stable, things that you can summarize quickly with like a, a constant rate, some kind of parameter that doesn't really move a whole, around a whole lot. So if you wanted to do that for population growth, it's pretty clear that the, the change in in people added, that's what's showing up in this column here, is the average, average annual change in people uh, in the world has been rising a ton. So adding around the change of the millennium, something like 75,000 people per year, or 75 million, right? Is that what that means? It's gotta be, 75,000. So we're, you know, we're up to about seven billion. So we're talking about very large numbers of people being added um, and on net, I think, is what we're talking about here because, of course, there are people who die and people who are born. So far, anyway, we don't have any immigration from other planets, so we're sort of a closed system. So it's births and uh, minus deaths get you this, this, this increase. If you look at the population growth rate, it's not a horrendous thing to say, well, you know, here's a period of pretty slow and consistently slow population growth uh, back, uh, what, uh, around the time of the Roman Empire, the fall of the Roman Empire, things like that, the medieval period and all that. 
in the more of the modern period, post-Enlightenment, I think the point eight between, I guess it must be between 1750 and 2000 is what we're looking at here. Point eight and 1.1 1 .1 are actually not that different from one another. So a population growth rate of about 1% is sort of reasonable for the world as a whole, kind of as a, as a, as a first round of what we think is kind of happening. And that's fine for you know, a model that's, that's simple, uh, a stylized model. A stylized model needs you to make some choices about these sorts of things. And so should we model the change in absolute numbers or the proportional change? It's going to be the proportional change. And what it looks like is something that, that, that may be familiar if, if you, like me, were sort of a math nerd in, in your earlier days in high school. Um, it means that the level of the population at time t, n, uh, n t, is equal to uh, the product of, of what it was at time zero, so n zero, whatever that number happened to be, times this exponential growth factor, e times, well, the, ex, the, the exp, <laughs> what, what does it say here? e to the r times t, I guess. The exponentiation of r times t, where r is the average annual rate of growth and t is, is indexing time. Uh, moving ahead then, uh, what one needs to be able to do is to think about how um, these are algebraically equivalent, taking the log of both sides. I'm trying to remember, I think, when I was talking about derivatives, how to, how to internalize this. When you take the log of a, of, a, of a product, you get the sum of the logs. And so what I haven't written here is that uh, RT is coming out of this piece. It's, it's the log of e to the RT, and it turns out the log of e to the RT is just RT. And then what you might do is solve for r, which is the difference in this log rate divided by t. So we're going to use this kind of notation a ton. Uh, what you might be more accustomed to is thinking about the, uh, the difference in the levels of the ends. Uh, I should say the proportional difference. So you, you might be thinking about the uh, nt divided by what you started with minus 1, for example. And that's another way of, of looking at it that we'll, we'll come back to to sort of try to familiarize yourself a little bit more with this. Uh, if, you, if you see this then uh, in a log scale, so what I've done is, is change the, you know, the, the arithmetic scale that just rises in equal increments of the level of something to something that rises in the log of something. And this, if you're familiar with spreadsheets, what you can do is change an axis on the spreadsheet uh, chart to be a logarithmic scale. And it does this. It means that if, you, if you've got a constant rate of growth, you'll end up seeing a straight line on the log scale, even though ultimately what's really happening uh, is something that looks a little bit more like this. Um, so here underneath it all, the levels of population are showing this very rapid increase uh, with the you know, growth rates that are actually themselves increasing. If you look at the log scale, you find something that is a little bit more linear even here now, but the thing is, of course, it's, it's increasing a bit more past log up there. Uh, so questions that are useful to think about. Has the growth rate been constant or increasing? It's, it's been on the rise, at least to a first approximation, I think it's, you know, it's okay to think about it as sort of being, well, somewhat more stable. Um, but what we're headed toward then is trying to understand kind of the deal with this kind of no population growth for a lot of human history and then a period of accelerating growth and why was that the case? So I'll leave you with that thought. Um, I'm available after class to chat. Leslie's office hours are also after class. Thank you, see you later.